All right, so this is Todd Atkins. Um, I've been doing another live today with uh, Catherine Ivey, uh, who I'll be bringing on here in just a moment. Yeah. If you have any questions you want to ask, uh, feel free to put them in the chat. Um, perhaps I'll ask them. Oh, what's up? What's up, guys? Yeah, that's, no, that's cool. We could both bring you on. Can you hear me? Okay. So what I'd like to do, like, yes, before yes, stars, yes. maybe let both of you introduce yourself, if there's anyone who's watching this that may not know who you are. Cool. Well, all right. Uh, my name's Catherine, and um, I'm currently down in town, Pennsylvania. I'm a registered nurse, and I'm a purple belt. Everybody. You may want to move up closer to the phone, I think, so I can hear you just a little bit. Okay. So, oh, we got some homies on here. So, I was saying, yeah, I'm AJ. I'm a brown belt at uh, Paramount Brazilian. Uh, owner at Rubes. Yeah, the sound's kind of cutting in and out. I'm not sure if it's. Let's see if it. Can I. We can it might really be because good. of wearing yeah. earphones so. or something. <laughs> so um, maybe. So when did you guys like start getting into jujitsu? I know I read a little bit about you, but uh, maybe you could talk about that. Yeah, go ahead. You go first. Cause... I think I'm coming up on eight years now. Um, so you're probably not too far behind. Yeah, I started because of him. Um, honestly, he was he was a white belt. I'm I'm I think I'm like. Putting me in triangles like all the time when I got home, and I was literally getting tired of telling me to try class. And now, when you guys are, you know, when you're with somebody who's doing jujitsu regularly, like how much did you like work on stuff at home or whatever? Um, so I think a lot of it for me personally, I started um, drunk wrestling all my buddies, and uh, that was a big part of it. Watching you, part of it. Um, I was fortunate that I started with my roommate time. Um, so we were able to work at home and stuff. And then Pat and I had Matt. At first we weren't, we weren't doing a ton, but, um, now it's like it's really a regular incorporation of our life. Right. We got the mats. We were training them on them all the time, but now we just go right to the gym. We train there. We're three minutes from our current gym, which is where we're going to be staying in Paramount. Um, but we're 30, we're going to be 30 minutes from our actual gym, the one we're going to own, Droog's. Um, so I'm sure between the two of them. Yeah, talk about that. I know you guys just kind of <laughs> opening up a gym now. Uh, yeah, so um, I was trying to escape the nine to five. And um, just something I've always been super passionate is I, I figured out the last probably year or two that I'm like super, super passionate about. So uh, we you know, set this long-term plan together with um, two of our buddies from the um, that really around. A long term plan that kind of got uh, excited when we found uh, like just the perfect building. So uh, now I'm like, on fast track to open up this year, actually. So uh, I'm really, really excited about that. Don't want to release the official date, but <laughs> um, we're really excited. We're, we bought the building and we settled on the building on April 13th. And we're looking to do a lot of upgrades to it. It already has a lot of stuff, like kitchen has a sh has showers, um, bathroom, lots of parking, um, and it's 6,000 square feet. The building is pretty large. So hopefully we'll be able to, like, get in, fix everything right away. And we hopefully we'll be able to open it. But it was a dream for a long time for the two of us. And then we really did. We found, like, the best two people, Dan and Emily, who are – there's all four of us are going to co-own the building. Um, and Dan's going to run the, like, the MMA program, whereas AJ and I are more focused on the jiu-jitsu side. And we all just have something like completely unique to bring. So now, I'm really excited. Which one of you started competing first, like regularly? Me. So I, I started uh, probably um, sometime before Cat, but I I jumped right into competing. Like I think, think um, in four months I was already path, but since I had a jump start on already training, 
I had a jump start. I, think. I was right behind him. It start, like I started um, so six years ago, but I, I had literally done just for a month before I, I started. Yeah, I think the so sound's like, still kind of chippy. I don't know. Maybe you could reposition the song or something. I'm not sure what it is. I don't know. I don't know what it is. Any better or worse? Yeah, yeah, that's fine. Can you hear us now? Yeah. Okay, we'll hold it. Try to hold it. Yeah. So I know, like, I saw that you were doing some shows that were like on Fight Pass or Fight to Win and stuff like that. Now, um, what what competitions were you doing? No, what's he doing? Yeah. What was I doing? AJ. Yeah, so um, currently I'm 4-0 in Fight to Win. I was slighted for a title shot, actually, and then I got COVID, um, which kind of was a bummer. But um, I've done everything up and down um, the local circuit, all the regional um, tournaments and organizations um, competed out as far as uh, the Philippines for IBJJF. So um, if it's grappling, I've pretty much done it. There's very few um, organizations or companies that I haven't really um, competed for. So – um, one of those guys that's any rule set anytime anybody. Uh, so I haven't really. Now, you know, why did you why did you decide to go to the Philippines for the tournament? So she's the bigger part of that. Cat's half Filipino. She had family out there. Um, so most of our vacations at this point are um, jujitsu related. So we we mask them as vacations, but it's really uh, to try to go out and either compete or to train or um visit some some jiu-jitsu people so um i've done probably let me think i've done ibjgfs all up and down i think the east coast um boston new york dc um but the philippines were just one of those excuses to go out there and compete so um see i was, was a little pretty, suspicious because cool i met my wife in hawaii and she's from local snorte so yeah where did they have the okay. tournament manila or where was it that's cool Right in Manila, um, it was actually the most beautiful venue we've at, probably ever competed at. It was right at the Mall of Asia um, in Manila, and it was like their op the middle of the mall, open air, like when the sun was setting, overlooking the water. <laughs> so it was really cool. Also really hot. It was like 100 degrees that Yeah, day. it was super so. hot. But it was cool. They had like fireworks going off in the background, and like it was it was a wild experience. It felt like it felt like much bigger than it than some like random yeah. IBJJ. You got to kind of be careful cool. out in Manila. Yeah, for and, sure. You know, as you get out, because... People just take stuff from yeah. me right away, you know. Like, <laughs> yeah, it's a wild. It's a, it was a wild experience, yeah. but so uh, <clears throat> you're. What weight are you competing at in like a uh, fight to win? Uh, usually, I do one fifty. I think I've done maybe one fifty five. Um, generally speaking, I can probably unless I. I mean, forty five is a hard cut for me. I could probably do it if I had to, but usually fifty and fifty five. Um, yeah, and how do they determine, like, you said you're going to have a title fight, but they don't really, I mean, I know they have a circuit of a bunch of shows here, there, and, you know, but how, is it, like, the? are you brown belt, black belt? It, yeah, I was doing it, but it, oh. it would have been for the, I guess, 155 brown belt Nogi title, or, it might have been purple at the time, was that it was purple? purple? It was purple, purple belt, um. So I had a pretty good run and then got sick. So that title kind of came and went. But there, yeah, their title system's kind of arbitrary. It seems like they kind of make them up as they go. I think they have like general weight classes and by belt, but they also have like all kinds of just like uh, arbitrary belts. It seems like. But I had a four and zero run, um, all by submission. I had the purple belt nogi uh, match of the year um, for the their entire organization. So. Um, I was on a pretty hot streak there for a second, but it is what it is. I mean, we've got bigger goals than um, purple belts. So when you're starting team. together, what do you think was like some of the uh, maybe like early game that you developed? Because I read where she had said both of you kind of your games followed each other a little bit in the beginning. Yeah, I mean, um, I was a big headlock guy um, when I first started, so – uh, I found a lot of success, early success with guillotines. I think most of my wins are probably guillotine. Um, and then that kind of developed into leg locks as people started to defend their neck. They started giving up their legs a lot. 
leg locks became the new meta with all the Dan and her guys and stuff. And we were getting up there cross training with those guys. So um, leg locks became a really big part of my game. But um, a sweet guillotine, like at the end of the day, it feels better than, than any leg lock personally. But um, I still have like a crazy like overall style. Um, very, very scramble based, very, very uh, get after it and look for submission based kind of guy. And um, whether she wants to admit it or not, she's got a very similar style. Different, different components. She's probably a lot more technical and composed than I am. Um, but as far as like approach and, and submission type thing, Not I would say wrestling. Why you kind of develop that game? Definitely. Um, I hadn't wrestled since I first started. Um, so I think I had enough of like a wrestling base to understand like body awareness and body mechanics without being like so ingrained in wrestling that I like made bad wrestling mistakes like leaving my head outside like i wasn't like a big wrestle boy per se you know what i mean but um i don't know it just it was something that stuck with me and uh like my body mechanics i guess just lended itself to guillotines and i just kind of fell in love with it my coach told me it's something to look for stick with it because the high percentage move you can get to it from almost anywhere you could use cash and kind of um advanced position so it's one of those things um, now, why do you think Catherine is more, what did you say, she's more, what was the word you used? Yeah, why, Catherine, why do you think that is? Technical. technical. <laughs> um, I don't, AJ calls himself a showman. Like, he's stylistically very entertaining to watch. Um, and I just, I'm not like that. I think, I think watching me is, like, fun, hopefully. Um, it's not, like, a boring game, but... I play more, I guess, in a sense, an IBJJF-based game. Um, like, I can definitely be submission-oriented, and a lot of my wins are by submission, but I also, I also have a very traditional game in that I like to, like, pressure pass, hold positions, and then control them. Uh, but it's not as – it's just it's just not as, like, fancy and exciting as AJ. He's more likely to do a flying arm bar, and I'm more likely to take you down, pass, go for a knee on belly and mouth. Like, so it's, that's a little different. Um, but I don't, I don't know. Yeah. He doesn't hold positions as much. He he moves very quickly, whereas I now I, like, you guys compete more. more without the gi or in the gi. Without the gi for me, yeah. Super fights typically, um, I think because of my style, I think I get booked for uh, no gi matches more. But uh, if it's like a local thing, like uh, grappling industry or something, I jump in, in the gi. I have no problem doing either. I prefer no gi, but I really don't mind competing in either. I'm currently getting ready for pans, um, so this will be my. I think this will be my first pan. Yeah, this is my first like major gi tournament um, that I've really prepped for. I did Master Worlds last year in the gi, um, and that was like that was what prepped me to be like, all right, I'm gonna do I'm gonna do more gi. But really, I, I like no gi better. I think I think I'm better at it. AJ and my uh, coach tell me that I'm I'm equal, but I like. Better. I have a world championship in no gi, so obviously I feel yeah, like I'm now, better at it. <clears throat> I was going to ask, you said you kind of did some cross-training with Donna and those guys. That, what did you take away from that? Um, the, Technically, I learned a lot. From from a skill standpoint, Um, it was really hard to find a better room than the blue basement. And it's in it's all of its glory. Um it was harder to find a better room than that. Um, the one thing personally that I took from it is um, how thankful I was for our team and how good it felt to be home when we came home from them, those sessions. Cause um, our team truly does feel like a family. Obviously, if you look what happened to the Dan and her death squad and it fell apart, it clearly it wasn't, but um, it, Seemed like a very segmented and segregated school as far as like very being very clicky and stuff. Um, they're a very high level, but it just didn't feel welcoming in the same regard. You know what I mean, everybody was kind, but like you, you probably most of their people don't even know who actually trains there and who is visiting. Whereas, like, I just felt like every, when we come home, it's it's family, so um, it was good perspective, especially you know, hindsight starting a gym, it's kind of like gives you what to look for and what to try to avoid. Um, so I mean, it was great training with the best guys in the world. We did plenty of private lessons and tried to glean what we could from those guys. But um, it was, overall, it was a really fun experience when it when it was like really in its heyday now, as the new basement. Do you think it's segmented because so much of them is focused on competition and maybe not on, you know, being a school per se? 
I think it's because it's it's world renowned. Everyone knows, you know, that's that's Henzo's, like the real Henzo's. Um, and I think a lot of people want to go there just to say they've been there. Um, whereas the actual people that were like training down there, there was it was very specific um, for the, I guess for the class. So like it, it was hard for any outsider or just hobbyist to actually be noticed there. And I think that's why that separation. Now, exists. what do you think? I mean, people talk about Donner's teaching. What what was your impression of it? I mean, uh, nobody in the world knows details the way that that guy knows details. Um, his just his insight in the way that he looks at things, and um, I've stolen so much from from those sessions. I've really learned a ton. Um, I love watching him. He's a little long winded, but he just it's because he's passionate. He just knows so much. Um, from an instructor standpoint, it's really hard to beat a guy like that. Um, but you can tell there's definitely like favoritism in the room. So it's tough because like he has his guys and then, I mean, they were his guys. So uh, it's, it's a two, you know, two sided approach, but I mean, he's, he's produced the guys that he has for a reason. He's, he's really the real deal. Yeah. Um, why do you think it fantastic. took so long for someone to come along that could detail it in the way that he did? I think, and I'll let you answer your end for it too. I think because jujitsu is still so much in its infancy and really even the guys that are really good still suck um, because, and this like, it sounds bad to say it like that, but that's what Gordon says all the time. Like people still get away with so much garbage because it's still so, so much in, in its infancy. And there's still so many like really like high level hobbyists and just like freak athletes that get through the, the cracks where these elite guys aren't truly like, perfectionist so he was like one of the first guys in my opinion that sat down and, and thought like how can i perfect the art as opposed to just win and i think he came up with a concept based approach that um he standardized everything and created systems and systematized everything that um people were learning moves but he was learning ideas you know what i mean that's exactly what i was gonna say the the word concept and systemize is everything he he knows jujitsu but he knows how to teach jujitsu and I think formerly people that were teaching jujitsu, it was just like, here's the technique, not so much why it works, but just do it and then it will work. And he, he more so focuses on very intricate details that I've never, I've never heard another coach ever say anything along those lines. So it's the concept and the idea of why it works and how your body almost relates to every piece of jujitsu. So I think that's why they are just next level. It's, it's crazy. Like I've trained with some of their guys and they just have like, like little secrets on like little like small things like gripping this way versus this way and like little stuff that I like when I teach jujitsu to our inner like intro class I call it like invisible jujitsu it's something that they're doing consciously that you wouldn't see just by watching it like there's just small grip nuances and small angle nuances that you can't feel and you can't see unless you're being told it and then once it once you once you notice it it's like completely game changing and they just have so many of those little details that just add up i mean he just he's just really a perfectionist but i mean he's as a, a person dramatic. you know everybody's different how's how are people going to remember all these details i guess that's what that's the question that kind of separates the the good people from the people that aren't right it's just for me i always tell like if i'm talking to anybody new it's just uh there's two things. It's mat time and application. Um, number one, you got to be on the mats. You got to be on the mats as much as possible. But um, dedicating yourself to truly applying those things is what helps you retain them. Um, I, I taught a leg lock class today, and I want to say 60% of the class was white belts that um, probably didn't grasp the entirety of the lesson. But if they walked away with a concept or a positional thing, um, that might change their entire game. So it's just one of those things that over the course of time, like you just got to pick up a piece at a time and then apply it and not like store it in the back. I mean, I've met, I know uh -huh. people that were maybe not the smartest people that got jujitsu really well, but I think more times than not, it's been people that are pretty intelligent that seem to be able to you know, follow that. I have met some people that, that, weren't, that were just, they do it for some reason, you know, but. That that's the one thing I always think of is like, 
you know, even though everyone can kind of learn jujitsu, it, it can be hard for some people to maybe not, you know, as a adept, you know, when it comes to. Yeah, I mean, there's uh, it's an advantage, you know. The same way strength is a, is an advantage, intelligence is an advantage. Um, you look at a guy like Gordon Ryan, who to me is the best guy in the world. Um, he is not very athletic at all. He's very clunky and kind of um, like awkward at times, but he's just so intelligent, and he's learning from probably one of the most intelligent instructors. So um, it's just like a perfect storm for those guys. Um, but yeah, I mean, intelligence is, is an a attribute the same way that strength is. And, you know, yeah, personally, the two of us probably aren't going to be making up for strength in any category, but where I feel like we, um, are both pretty adept is being intelligent and understanding concepts and, you know, the, the more meta stuff. And, and that's where you win or lose personally, I, I, I feel like, but yeah. Now Gordon's going to face Hill Billy Hammer. What, what do you think about that match? No, Billy Hammer is good, but he's not good enough. Gordon is, he's a one of a kind specimen. And I don't really think that there's going to be many people that beat him. Um, if any, any really, I mean, when's the last time he's lost? So. Yeah, I don't, I don't know who beats him, to be honest with you. I think the best chance for somebody to beat Gordon is uh, a guy like Nicky Rod, who's going to out wrestle him, maybe pin him and hold him for all of an ADCC match. But, um, He's going to take on a guy who's significantly lighter, significantly less experienced. Um, on short notice, yes. it's just not a good Smaller. match for anybody. I, go, I, say what you want about the person. He, he's, he is what he is. He's phenomenal. And even on his worst days, which um, I'm not even sure we've ever seen, seen him compete at 100%, he's still years above anybody right now. It's, and it's, it's just not even close. I mean, this is a guy that takes the submission he wants to choose for the evening so he can sell some videos, puts it in an envelope, and then he finishes with that at the end. I mean, there's no way that somebody could beat that, in my opinion. What about ADCC? Do you see anybody that could do it in that? Um, I, I, I know people say Pena because Pena's been before, but I, I don't see it. I really think it's got to be a guy like Nicky Rod who knows his game in and out, um, who has a significant amount of um, wrestling experience and can out-wrestle him maybe in an ADCC format, um, might have a little bit of leg technique because he's trained with them. But, I, I mean, the first thing that comes to my head is, yeah, it's Nicky Rod. Um, but I just don't see anybody beating Gordon personally. <laughs> now, Cat. when you start your school, are you going to – kind of teach in the same uh the same categorical style as as donna or, or how do you think you would do it we're going to be teaching all concept based teaching it's going to be it's going to be pretty similar to danaher's teaching um others like gary tonin gordon ryan they all teach very similarly uh, frank rosenthal who we learned from a lot john Callistein. it's a combination of all of those guys they teach um, a full system. They teach why it works, the plan A, the plan B, and that's exactly how we're planning to teach our, at our gym. Yeah, if, if I had to sum up, and I'm really, really high on myself here, maybe I'm a little biased. If I had to sum up my teaching, um, the way I go about it, my approach to it, it would be a, con it would be a, a mix between our current instructor, Brad Court, who I think is – uh, phenomenal and in the way he teaches is extremely regimented and um, formulaic um, so you know kind of what to expect every time you walk into that class which for me the structure is good um, Danaher with his approach to systematizing things and then uh, Christian Woodmansey who I appreciate so much because he's 125 pounds maybe soaking wet um, so his understanding of jujitsu and what makes it near perfect um, is I think heads and shoulders above most people. And I've taken so many classes under him and I like greatly appreciate his insight on how, um, he teaches and, and kind of the way he looks at jujitsu and drilling and, um, just his approach to people and in coaching. So those would be my three that I kind of like look at is Danaher, um, our coach Brad Court and then Chris. Maybe both of you give me this, your opinion on this. So you, you know, you're both competitors. Let's say you're trying to shoot for somebody who's at that skill, like a Gordon Ryan, a Gary Tone, whatever the case may be. 
how do you close the gap on somebody like that? I'm going to start um, because I think closing the gap for me is a lot easier than closing the gap for AJ. Um, you mentioned earlier, like I did a, a fight on UFC Fight Pass, and that was against Danielle Kelly. Um, and Danielle Kelly is one of the best in the world, and she's a black belt. And I'm just a, I'm a purple belt. I am not one of the best in the world. But the the women in the 115 pound division, or just women in general, there's not a there's not a lot of us. Um, so being able to like bridge that gap has been actually a lot easier than I initially expected. There's there's never enough women. There's never enough young women. Um, obviously, people sometimes like to look at women. So there's there's that. Um, so for me, the gap is I already I already feel like it's closing very quickly. Uh, you know, it, it would take me a couple more years to get my black belt, and then I would be competing in the same division as like Bastos. So um, do I think I would win? Uh, probably not. <laughs> She's amazing. She's definitely like my one of my favorite grapplers. She's number one, I think, in the world for women. But would I be right alongside of her competing? Yeah. And then do I think that maybe they would offer like a super fight against one of those girls? I think it's already happening. So well, talk um, about the Dan really Danielle Kelly that. match right quick. I mean, maybe just take us through that. Yeah, I don't. I don't even really know how that happened. Um, I went to Worlds, Nogi Worlds. I, I'm, I did Masters, so I did Masters 1. I just turned 30, and I came back um, a Master 1 World Champion. And that triggered, I think, a lot of um, things on the table for me that I think came sooner than I had expected. So um, shout out to, what's that guy's name from the, uh, the card? Oh, my goodness. Uh, from Webb. Jonathan Webb. Jonathan Webb. Um, he messaged me like right away and was like, "Would do you want to have a fight with Danielle Kelly on UFC Fight Pass?" And I was like, "Sure." I didn't even think twice about it. it Seems like a good idea. Um, I've I've met Danielle a few times before. Actually, we trained with her in the blue basement, and then I actually had gone to Silver Fox to train with her. Um, so I was like really excited because I was like, "Wow, this is crazy!" Like I remember rolling with her as a newer blue belt, and now I'm gonna like go compete against her on like a stage where the UFC Fight Pass is such a big deal, in my opinion. Um, and it was great. She was super respectful. She uh, did amazing, but I didn't. I didn't feel completely outclassed, which is what's exciting. She didn't submit me, um, but she did hold the top for a long time. She hit a very nice double leg, which I'm sure is like probably a meme somewhere. Um, and then you know she was on the top. I was finally able to escape, and then we got you know a little bit of a scramble in. But it was great. It was a great experience, and she was really nice the whole time. She was really nice before. She was really nice after. Um, I would say, like, peripherally, she's a nice acquaintance, and I would actually like to, I would like to train with her. Yeah, again. I have a friend who, like, he just started. So. Somebody else, like, immediately. You know, so he said, it's like, I can't find any. You know, I'll find them, and then they get snapped by something. Big. Yeah. You know, like, later. Because they were like, who, like, who is this girl? Um, like, why, why is she going against Danielle? But I mean, it all worked out. It was. It, I don't. I now, AJ, kind of same for you. I was asking, how do you? Like she said, it's probably more applicable to you. You know, you're shooting for something like that. How do? You, how are guys going to close the gap with this entity that you don't see anybody beating? You know, like Gordon Ryan. I don't know. I mean, it's just it's just smart math. The reality is, like, I have a full-time job right now, um, and I just have to make the most of my mat time. It's the reality of it. Um, so they might be able to train four hours. I might be able to train one hour a day. I've got to make that hour the best hour I possibly can and train with intention. Um, I don't know if I'll ever close the gap on, like, top guys in the world. I'm sure I'll have matches against all of them. I'd love to get in one of those crazy 155-pound brackets and see what I'm see what I'm made of. Um on a good day, I feel like I can. There's, there's, I can put anybody in the world out. Um, but the reality is, like, there's just uh, the the professional end of it is just uh, accelerating so quick that um, my my goal at some point shifts between um, being one of the top guys in the world to creating one of the top guys in the world or ladies. Um, we have some teens in our class that are um, absolutely phenomenal too. So. Um, at some point, the goal shifts. You know what I mean? If, if, if things work out, then it works out. I just got off of a pretty long layoff for ACL surgery. So um, it was kind of a, a reality check as far as where my goals were. But um, that being said, if, you know, uh, Seth Daniels or, or Sam Michael or one of these promoters dropped in my inbox tomorrow and said, hey, do you want to fight Gianni Grippo tomorrow? Um, 
I would cut the weight and do whatever I had to in a heartbeat and um, not think about it twice. It's, it's in, I'm a hundred percent, anyone, anywhere, anytime. Um, very realistic about what the outcome would be, but um, that's not what we fight for. So um, I don't know if I can close. So you the think app, for now it's just where really guys would have to try and find the advantage, like you were saying with Nikki Rod or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. For anybody to chase a guy like Gordon, it's just, uh, I don't know. I think Gordon's in the league of his own, but that number two spot is up for taking for whoever wants yep. it, I think. The match or? I personally, I think Gal is going to find a way out of it. Um, but if he shows up, it's it going to be a bad day for him. Or a bad match. It's either going to be the most boring match ever, or Gordon's going to beat him. One Why do you think it'd be boring, be. though? How do you think you would execute? Uh, just what I've seen is when you get these matches with the guys that you get excited for, it becomes – if you think about, like – I don't know how, like, into the sport you are, but if you think about, like, Keenan and Gordon when that first happened and that was, like, an hour and a half match and it was one of the worst matches of all time, um, now that Gordon's even more dangerous, I think that people are going to play very – um, negating game and just try to stop him from doing things. It's become this like thing where you know surviving a Gordon Ryan match is almost as much as a win for anybody in anybody's eyes. So um, I wouldn't. And Gal Val is also not super dangerous. And if we're talking statistically or biased, either way, he's just not a very offensive submission ranked guy. So I mean, what's the best case scenario for him? Is he has a twenty minute, twenty forty minute, or whatever the the max is for it? I forget is it forties. I forget how long those matches are. It's like 20 or 40 minutes or something crazy for ADCC super fights. He's going to ride out every second of it, and it's going to be boring. I mean, that's how that's how most of his matches are. Um, Gordon's a lot more offensive-minded, um, but he also takes a little bit to get going. He doesn't really sub people within a minute or anything. So it's going to be a long, drawn-out match where he's just going to – Yeah, Val's going to run the whole time. Gordon's going to chase him. And then once it comes down to attrition um, – I think Gordon's now, gonna catch him and say, Catherine, did you do combat jujitsu as well? I did. I did do it. We were on the same card actually, and we had almost the identical so same match. Two, kind of anything materialize or so I trained for it um, pretty significantly. I brought in like a bunch of girls to the gym that are either like fighters or they have experience or they do Muay Thai. Um, it felt great. And then was like paranoid about it the whole time. My match was actually like right before AJ's. Um, I he at least got a slap in. She shot on me right away. I shot a double leg and I guillotined her. And I think it was like over in thirty two seconds. So I act I did a combat match, but I I didn't really do a combat. Now going match. forward, what do you think some of the things are? I know you have your gym goals off. Get into it. saw Danielle got signed by one. I mean, what are some things? Yeah. Super exciting. Um, well, I'd really like to win a world championship in the gi. Um, and I also, I would like to win a world championship in no gi at adult. Um, I don't know if that, that goal is as feasible as I want it to be, but it's definitely something that I, I would appreciate. Um, and then just to keep, keep out there grinding, I have a lot more competition goals, which I think realistically I'll have to look at as I step more into like the coaching aspect and, you know, the business owner aspect behind this gym. But I'm nowhere near done. I'm waiting, you know, in the future, I can't wait to get my brown belt. I'm waiting to compete at adult at brown belt um, in Nogi so that I could try to, like, use some leg locks a little bit more in the IBJJF setting. And then, I don't know, probably um, some more fight to wins. I haven't been on one in a while. I'm just, I'm 2-0 and I think at fight to win, right? Yeah, 2-0. and um, So. And what about you, AJ? What are you kind of looking at? Um, Getting my black belt. And going from white to black under Coach Bad um, is my major goal. Um, I've been trying to round out my game and become, like, just really good in every aspect um, so that it's undeniable at some point that I'm a tag team Brad Court black belt. Um, right now, I'm kind of pumping the brakes on um, competing unless something that really comes up. Like, I might do some grappling industries here and there, but, like, um, I was a guy that competed every, every month, uh, multiple times a month since Wipeout, so I'm um, kind of pumping the brakes on that. I'll jump in stuff here and there, keep active. Um, I want to get an IBJJF gold. 
whether it's adult masters, I don't really care. It's just something that's kind of eluded me. Um, any title in any organization would be cool. But what I'm gearing up for right now is I've been working with Dan, who's um, going to be our striking guy at our gym, um, trying to get my striking set up so I can take a fight this year. So I want to take a fight or two amateur. And um, I have a friend who has he has amateur fights on his car. But I'm sure there's lots of places you can do that. But yeah, I have a friend who he just started it. We're pretty t with Art of War, and they treated him pretty good. So I'll probably just jump on, mm -hmm. um, aiming for. October, um, as long as I go with my knee and then my hands are up to par, uh, I would like to get some get some MMA experience because I feel like it's a huge part of the martial arts and opening up a, a gym. I feel like I want to have that experience to be able to pass down. The How hard is it to open a gym? Stuff. You think just to the business a little bit? How difficult was it? <laughs> I mean. It's hard, but I'm pretty sure opening a gym would be nothing comparatively to buying a commercial. <laughs> um, that's really been, I mean, we're still in process of opening the gym and trying to figure it out. So I'm sure a lot of stuff will come up. But right now, our main goal is just making it to settlement on the building. We're really lucky um, because we do help like run our current coach's gym, Coach Brad. Um, I work there. We both teach there. Uh, we do like client appointments. So in understanding how to run a business, I actually think we're we're pretty set. But in learning how to be um, commercial real estate owners is it's a whole nother thing. So we're learning so much at one time. I know AJ actually commented like this experience has been overwhelming, but it's actually been really rewarding because we've learned so much about the business, about the business of the building, and so how they make it. Were the they building. making it difficult for you to acquire the space? Is that what it was? Surprisingly, I think we were really lucky um, and they they didn't make it as difficult as I thought. It's just a lot of it's a lot of work, yeah. you know, making sure that everything's up to par. The zoning is right. The codes are right. It's going to be this, a, a correct space for us. We just had the inspection. So I'm sure there was more than enough things that we need to fix. And then we're in the loan process now. And it's just like it's pretty tiring. I mean, yeah. It's a lot. We had to do like one of our one of the uh, co-owners had to do like a P test for it just to like get life insurance for the building. Like that's that's a lot. <laughs> so yeah, I'm not I'm not nearly as uh, anxious about running it. Getting it started has been a process, especially because it's so uh, so fast. I mean, I've used the word expedited other things here, but it has really been expedited. We really pushed for a quick closure. Um, it's a building that we didn't even expect to look at. We looked at it just for shipping gigs, and it was like, wow, this is the building. We came back and looked at it the second day that night, and then it was like, boom, all right, how do we get pre-approved for a loan? How do we get zoning? How do we put a business plan together? How do we get funds? Like, it, it was just the the commercial end of it, not the martial arts end of it, has been crazy. I know a lot of people kind of told us to go in the route of, uh, leasing, but we decided to build, uh, buy a building. So um, a 6,000 square foot industrial building uh, is quite the undertaking to, to, to take on um, from a, from an ownership standpoint. So um, it just nicks the martial arts end of it. We haven't even gotten there yet. You know, other than, you know, a logo and a website, we haven't even started teaching. So the, the real estate end of it is like its whole, it's this own bear of its own that I'm ready to be done with. Once it comes to being business time, I'll feel much better about it, I feel like. <laughs> it's unlimited. Um, but right now, our current business plan is 55 pages. And that's just the plan. The, um, we had like a questionnaire, which ended up being like 13 pages. But just to apply for one of the zones that we need, I think is like 10 pages. So currently, I'm comfortable saying we've probably done over 200 pages at least of paperwork. It seems like too much to red go. tape. Like, you know, the. It's it's a million. So they want to, you know, if we're buying a million dollar building. They want to yeah. make sure we are going to have the money to cover it. Um, but really, the same process as a house. It's just more extensive. The business plan was like, it was a lot. But we used an app and that was really it, it laid it for us and honestly it helped our idea come to fruition like 
here is, we learned a lot through the business plan. We knew how we were going to make money, where we were going to lose money, the timelines we could do it on. So overall, it was Yeah, I didn't think about it that way. It just seems like there's so much in the way of getting to where you want to go. A lot of people just not want to do it. nothing has really like stopped us. It's just been, there's, I mean, it's been a full-time job essentially getting contractors and, and getting experts for this. And, um, I was, I mentioned it the other day, like so much of these like little rinky dink gyms pop up. And I keep thinking to myself, like, how, how did they manage that? And then I think like we decided to buy a million dollar property and completely start our own thing separate. So in that regard, like, yeah, it's a big, it's a, it's its own thing. Like, so I took it for granted how, how easy people probably have compared to us. But that being said, we'll have an asset. We'll have um, something to own and be proud of outside of the building. I mean, outside of the, the business, if the business ever fails, we have a million dollar property with 3.6 acres and a 6,000 square foot building that, that we're sitting yeah. on that we can. You guys tell me about this from, guy. You know what I mean? He's so cheeky. That's why I'm holding him. He's being so bad. But this is Miko. He's wild. He's a wild guy. You can see his little fat pouches. He's I, pretty cute. You want to tell him about Miko? For like, yeah, so, you know, skunk up the house? He can't. No, he doesn't. Okay. He has his scent glands removed, so he can't spray. Surprise. He'll poof at you, but like he'll show you, he'll show you his tail, but he actually. Yeah, it's, he sometimes has little toots. And that's it. Nothing yeah, I didn't happen. even know you could do label it in that way. Yeah, I don't think you can do it without it because he tries to spray, but he can't. I've always wanted one. We actually had a raccoon, a pet raccoon, for uh, I think five or six years, and he passed away sadly last year. Um, Miko came to us as a foster. Um, he was like 30 something pounds and um, couldn't even walk. He was in really bad shape. Um, somebody basically had him and neglected him and didn't really take care of him. Um, so his original breeder reached out to us because we knew her. Um, and she asked if we would foster him for a little bit, get him like, you know, kind of help him get back to um, decent shape. And then she would take him back in and find a home for him. But, uh, he just became a part of the family, so you can see him and the dog keep trying to. That's where all the noise you're hearing. They they're keep fighting. They keep trying to. They wrestle. So, um, he just became a part of the family. So when it came to let him go, we just decided to keep him. Coons, and, uh, that can be pretty bad started. news too. At sometimes, I mean, yeah, yeah. I mean, I don't re recommend. I'm kind of losing the sound again, I think. Yeah. Oh. Um, but he's pretty easygoing. I mean, he's kind of like a mixture of a cat and dog. He's pretty independent, but he isn't as, he's definitely not as crazy as a raccoon. The raccoon was like a Yeah, I missed what you said about the raccoon. What, did you ever have any, like, uh, negative engagements with it? I mean... From a temperament standpoint, he was he was perfect. I mean, we got him when he was like five weeks old, and he was like he was a pet. He truly was a pet, but um, he was also a raccoon. So while I didn't really worry about him from a personal raccoon standpoint, I mean, he did get into everything. We baby we had a baby proof everything. He had his an entire room to himself, an entire bedroom, um, which he tore apart and um, got into the walls and did this that. I mean, he was a raccoon. It, it really it really is everything they expected to be, but. Um, as far as being like a pet and a best friend, like I couldn't have asked anything more from him. Now I want to, I want to thank really you guys ideal. for taking the time to do this. I always like to let people leave the interview on something. If there's something important that we didn't hear, or if you want to tell your business that's coming along, whatever you might want to discuss. Go ahead. Yeah, you go ahead. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I just want to give first a shout out to Hyperfly um, because that's who I'm sponsored by. So I always like to mention them. And if you like their apparel, you can get it at the link in my bio. Um, but more importantly, I really want to take a huge shout out to um, our business partners, Dan and Emily, because this is now the second time we're doing a podcast without them. Um, but they're very much so like a part of what's going to be our future. So um, if anybody's watching and they're in the Pottstown, Chester County, Phoenixville areas, um, definitely make sure to check us out. You guys can go to 
www.droogsmma.com or follow us on Instagram at droogsmma. Um, you guys won't be sorry. I'm really excited to open the gym. It's something that's like really close to all of our hearts and we're going to pour every bit into it. So please come visit. Yeah. Um, I would pretty much, you know, echo the same thing. Um, my Instagram is AJ underscore Jitsu. Um, a hundred percent follow Drew's MMA. Uh, I'm really, really excited for it. Um, we even just added a section last night on the website about guest instructors as one of our like actual instructors. Um, it's going to be very community based. I want to make sure that the uh, people that sign up get the best talent in the area. Um, so I want to bring people in all the time, uh, make it very community based, do a ton of events, do tournaments, whatever we can um, to get people involved. So um, Drew's MMA um, is the place to follow. Go check out the website. Um, and that's pretty much all I got. But I'm very excited for that venture, and I appreciate you having us on. Now, Catherine, does he eat any pants yet, or, you know, adobo? Yeah. Or... Does AJ? <laughs> oh, my gosh, all of it. We love, and we love chicken adobo, okay. and we love uh, lumpy, which is so good. They're so good. So he went when we went to the Philippines, he tried all the food, and – then he loved it, and then he got really sick. So it was a, definitely a different way of life. What we don't like is we don't like the chick on his thing. Oh, the, the blue. blue. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know the stuff that my wife likes, so she gets mad at me a lot for that. But, you know. Yeah, I don't do. I don't do the uh, extremely, extremely Filipino food. I'll eat their main dishes, but the weird. The key fish. Yeah, Have you yeah, yeah, had them around that yet? Yeah. I don't think he's had steak You know, fish small before. fish that, that are sound, smell know. horrible. I can't even the smell to you. That. It's an, like I won't let my wife make it in the house. That's how bad it is. <laughs> bad. Yeah, no, I'm not. I'm not if it smell, I have a really bad stomach. If it smells bad or looks bad or anything in between, I can't eat it. Um... So the Filipino food that I do like, I love, but man, there is some wild stuff that I will not come. Yeah, you should make it smell that at least. It smells anywhere. horrible. I don't. I don't know what I could just compare it to, but it's horrible. That's all I can. Yeah. Pillow casings, everything. It's awful. I, I warned you about it. So if you ever run into it, you're gonna know. I told you, you'll know it right away. It's like a. You know, homicide detectives say that when they smell their first body, you know, that's kind of. Oh, my goodness. No, See, thank you. No yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's bad. <laughs> I don't know what it's called. I have to find the word out for you. But yeah, yeah, I appreciate you guys taking time to do this. I couldn't do this stuff without people that are willing to do it. And uh, wish you good luck on your, your new building and your new gym. And if you ever want to come back on and talk about stuff, I'd love to have you do it again. Yeah, hopefully the um, Absolutely. I would love to do a follow up. I mean, it'd be great. Um, I mean, maybe this time in two or three months would be would be ideal. Hopefully, we can do it from the gym. Get Dan and Emily on. Um, you guys can check out the new digs. You're gonna love it. So excited! You guys are gonna love it. It's gonna be great, and it's gonna be orange. So it's gonna be. Well, very I appreciate fun. it, and yeah, definitely, I'd love to do a follow up in a few months. It'd be awesome. Yeah, it was yeah, great awesome. meeting you guys, and uh, I just look forward to talking to you again sometime. Take care. Awesome. Thank Thanks, you. Thanks, Dad.